to spend the rest of my time that I have here, the next 12 minutes, talking about the law and the freedom of grace. I, I think it's important um, to kind of talk about this, um, to understand what was Paul defending? What was Paul, what was Paul talking about? See, the, the gospel of grace that is free from the law does not mean that good works are not going to be done. I want to kind of kind of some of the stuff that I don't want us to think the wrong thing, that if we just worry about grace only, that we don't have to do anything good, that good works don't occur. And believe me, good works... Sometimes a good work is that I take care of my family correctly. And well, I can show you that in Scripture, that that's what, that's what the good work is. It's not that good works don't occur and they don't need to be done. In fact, the Jerusalem apostles, they wanted Paul. All we say is, take care of the poor. And Paul's like, that's the very thing we wanted to do anyways. Right? Also, the, Ten Command- uh, the gospel does not... A grace does not eliminate the Ten Commandments as a moral law. But the gospel of grace means that no one is right by keeping the Ten Commandments. You cannot take the Ten Commandments. Oh, I keep that one. Oh, I must be be saved. I must be righteous. I'm keeping all the Ten Commandments. That's not. It has nothing to do with that. Your, Your salvation has to do with the grace that comes from God and God alone. When I'm saved... God works on me to keep the Ten Commandments. And believe me, he'll work on you for a long time because those things are ingrained in us. Those things are things we don't want to do in our flesh. The gospel of grace means that no one is right before God because of their ability to follow and keep commandments. Performing good works and keeping good morals does not make you right with God. It's a result of your rightness with God. And if you think it does, you're in the danger of becoming pious and prideful. I mean, it's because of what I did, right? I'm a good person. I'm a good person. It's because I did. I'm that. No, you're not. Even Paul says, I, I, oh, what a wicked, wicked man I am. Who can save me? Jesus, that's it. If I do it on my own, I'll fail. Highest law keeping destroys the unity in the church because what do we do? We start comparing ourselves to everybody else. Well, you don't, you don't keep the Sabbath, or you don't do this, or you don't, you don't honor your father and mother like I do. The only person we should compare ourselves is Jesus. And guess what? Every time I compare myself to Jesus, I come up short. I do. Because he's still working on me. And there will be a day that I'll stand next to Jesus and I'll realize, yeah, it was you all the time. It was you all the time. And I'm righteous because of you, not me. So it's that constant battle we have with our flesh to to overcome it. But see, when we have the gospel of grace through faith, it yields a deep relational unity in the church. When it shapes our when, when the gospel of, of, of grace shapes our relationships, there is this miraculous fruit that's a, that gets developed. Because, see, we have a tendency to rank sin, don't we? You know, we, we, we hear somebody say, well, yeah, I, I struggle with lust, or I, I struggle, with, I struggle with, with greed. We're like, yeah, you know, I, I'm with you. I got the same problem, brother. Come on, give me a hug. Right? Or give me a whatever, since of COVID, whatever. But understand that we rank sin. But if the problem is, is that if we are suffering with marriage problems, if we're suffering with, suffering with homosexual tendencies, if we're suffering with de- depression, if we're suffering with things, things that people will, you know, will consider you know, taboo, we won't share it. We won't talk about it. Why? Because we don't want people to think that we're that bad of a Christian. And we don't want to be thrown out of the relationship. So we hide it and we try to deal with it ourselves. When the reality is, God gives us the body of Christ to come alongside us and walk through it with us. And that's what Paul is defending. He's saying, whoa, whoa, whoa you got to have unity in the church with both Jews and Gentiles. That's the beauty of God. That's what he's doing. He's the creator of all men. But when we realize that the grace that I receive is not contingent on my performance, we begin to find peace. Oh, Oh, so I don't, I don't have to worry about all those problems I have. Oh, oh, wait a minute. 
Now, I didn't say that because God will begin working on you. The Holy Spirit will start convicting you of the things you're doing wrong, and you'll want to change them. That's people always ask me, oh, Pat, I mean, <laughs> how do I know? If I'm sinning, because I'm a believer, but I sin, how do I know when I've taken it too far? I said, you feel guilty about it? Yeah, then you've not gone too far. Don't keep pushing it, though. <laughs> Don't push yourself further away. Run towards Christ. The Holy Spirit's convicting you. But we realize also that that same grace that saves me saved my neighbor, right? They have the same grace, and I need to give them the same grace. We are all sinners saved by grace on the road of transformation. We are being changed every day. Some of us quicker than others. Some of us slow. It's okay. God knows what he's doing. And understand that that transformation does not occur in a vacuum. Hence why Paul brought two men with him to show that. A Jew through and through and a Gentile through and through. We're on this road together and we must keep each other and help each other overcome the desires of the flesh. But we have to open up. And if we open up, we have to be loving towards those people who are talking to us. And we need to only share what we are told to share. We need to be honest with them. And we need to hold them accountable. It's the same grace that's offered by Christ. And he works through us and through his body, the church, to transform our lives. 